For today's quiz, we're going to talk about fuses. And this is a classic fuse. You've got metal on one side, metal on the other, glass, and I don't know if you can see this, I'll hold this up with a white background, and there's a piece of metal connecting them in between. This is a rather large fuse, probably about 5 amps, 10 amps. A smaller fuse might just look like a piece of steel wool in that piece of glass. And this is really what we're talking about. Steel wool looks like a hair, but can even be thinner depending on the size of the fuse you want to use. Our quiz today simply asks, where should we put a fuse in our circuit to protect our more valuable pieces of equipment, such as this stepper motor, which is very expensive. So let me hold that quiz up now. As always, mark your answer as completely as possible Enlist your level of confidence. Typical student responses include, fuse one must be the answer because it's right along the battery. Most power supplies have some type of fuse. So you want the fuse right at the power supply. Others will say, no, we're trying to protect the stepper motor or your resistor, whatever that happens to be. So it should be fuse two. And others will say, no, it's got to be fuse three because that's going to end up stopping all of the current going through the circuit. So those are the typical student responses that we get. All right, let's go and explain what we think is going to happen here. Uh, first of all, the answer is F3. That's what protects the circuit. This F1 right here with a fuse going across the power supply, that's a short circuit it should blow right away. And I'm saying the fuse should blow because if the fuse is too thick or robust, well, our power supply could be damaged or ruined. So you would never put a fuse in parallel. And uh, F2 up here, it's a bad idea. You're not really protecting anything. You're basically just giving no resistance across that resistor. So uh, we're gonna plug this in in a second. I would expect F1 to blow immediately, and then to protect the rest of the circuit, I would expect F3 to also blow. Let's try this out. All right, so I have my circuit built, and I'll use my diagram right here. Here's fuse one. Our power supply comes down. I have a little piece of steel wool that is in between our two leads here. Coming around the circuit, here's my resistor. I'm just gonna use a light bulb. And in parallel, you can see I've got another fuse, another piece of steel wool. And then as that circuit comes back around here, I've got this third piece of steel wool. And we're ready to go, so I'm gonna turn this on and let's find out what happens. So if I plug this in, we see right away that burns up and that burns up. So, uh, rather interesting. All right, as we saw, our steel wool caught on fire. And that's what you want. You might say, why in the world would you ever want a piece of steel wool to catch on fire? Well, look, a fuse is simply a weak link. We want this insignificant in terms of cost, piece of steel wool to end up burning up. That power supply that we were looking at or this stepper motor is very expensive. We don't want to end up spending a couple hundred dollars to replace those pieces. So we take this piece of steel wool, we'll put it in glass, so if there's a little fire, it's contained, it's not a big deal. You pull one fuse out, you put a new one in. And by the way, we have other kinds of fuses. If we're really worried about too much of an arc or too much of uh, a fire hazard, we can actually put sand inside here also. So uh, that's the main reason why we have a fuse. I'll take you through a few more applications of these fuses. All right, this is a, an old service piece from a house, which is probably a 60 amp service. These are fuses. Before I show you this, let me put this down. You might see something like this on a power supply. You have your fuse, your fuse holder, and if it ever burns out, you put a new one in, you could screw it back in and it makes the full connection. On houses, we used something like this. Instead of having these rectangular cylindrical fuses, we had ones that would screw in to what looked like a light bulb socket. Now this is dangerous. A piece of metal 
is going to go right across the top of this glass. So you can look in and see if it's blown. This one happens to be blown. The problem with these, I have a new fuse that I want to put in, is you could see I could accidentally, imagine being in the dark, I could accidentally stick my finger in here and complete the circuit. That would be terrible. But I could simply maybe use a flashlight, screw this in, and voila, the lights on the house come back on. Or at least we hope. Maybe the fuse is gonna blow again because whatever was the short circuit might cause this one to end up blowing. Back in the old days, there were some really bad ideas that people used. Remember, I have a very small piece of metal. Some would say I keep putting a fuse in and it keeps blowing again. Maybe I could use a nice copper penny. Doesn't have a lot of resistance. Maybe I could jam that in there and get it to work. Really bad idea because what you've done is you've effectively made the fuses um, the more robust part of the circuit and the wires in your walls and in the rest of your house made them the fuse. They could catch on fire. So never, ever, ever replace a fuse with a penny or a fuse or a breaker that is larger than it was designed for. So if I put a 30 amp fuse and this is only rated for 15, I've done the same thing as put a penny in there. So um, that's one type of fuse that we could use on houses. We don't typically use these anymore, but some older houses will have them. We might also have mains. Let me pull these out. And they are just much larger fuses. And in fact, I they would fit in here, but I ripped off the one end to, to show how thick the metal is inside that fuse. You would replace that, you'd put that back in, and voila, hopefully your house would be working again. Even older houses, they would have these bare, just sticking on the wall on this porcelain you would end up, without getting electrocuted, uh, you'd either take a pair of tongs or something and push these in. Very, very dangerous. So we've pretty much moved away from fuses and we've gone to circuit breakers. All right, I fetched a circuit breaker. This is what a standard one looks like. You'll have your leads coming in on one side and the other. Normally in some kind of case, all you do is flick the switch and you can hear them snap back off. And these are much safer because there's really nothing exposed, nothing for you to accidentally touch. And you can use them over and over again. They heat up too much and they snap. How that happens? Well, I have a little demonstration that I can set up for you. And it's all going to be uh, using this bimetallic strip. And this bimetallic strip, we're going to heat it up. Now, bimetallic simply means we've got uh, two different metals. Maybe this one side is copper, the other side might happen to be brass or some other material. If I were to put them together very tightly and heat them up, one is going to expand more than the other and it'll tend to bend. Well, that process happens inside the circuit breaker and I'll show you that right now. Here I've got my bimetallic strip and it's connected to the battery via this red wire. Current can come up, go through that bolt, down around to our light bulb. So if I connect this, you could see the light bulb is on. But what happens if I send too much current through here? Well, I could put a fuse, but that fuse is gonna end up blowing. In other words, once it's done, it's done. Maybe you need this to come back on. That's the beauty of a bimetallic strip. Let me show you what I mean. If I were to take a heat gun and turn it on and heat this strip up, it bends and it'll eventually cool back down. When it cools back down, the light will go back on. You might think, when would I want something like this? Well, if you didn't know, a lot of trailer brakes on vehicles are electric. If you're coming down a mountain and you suddenly end up having a power surge and you blow a fuse, you don't get your brakes back. A bimetallic strip would simply cool and it would allow you, A, to know that you've overloaded, but if you can get some power back, even for a short burst, you might be able to slow that vehicle, pull off to the side of the road, put it in park, and uh, fix your problem. So this is almost cool, and then it would turn back on. And if I heated it back up, it would simply bend off. So that's a real world application of this. This process of bending metallic strips back and forth happen inside your circuit breakers. Now look, they're, they're meant to just snap off once. So we have to spring load them. If they heat up, boom, they snap and they stay off. They eventually cool and then you can snap them back on. 
One of the times that you might want to work continuously with this bimetallic strip is a thermostat. This is an old school thermostat that you might see on an old house where you could turn it back and forth. What you're really doing is you're taking a very long metallic strip like that, bimetallic strip, and the longer it is, the more effect you get. And we've got a mercury switch here. So as the house cools, it will end up shutting off and that mercury goes to two leads that are inside that encapsulation of glass. And then if you need the heat on, it'll simply either unwind or wind and change the position of this back and forth. And it does this continuously. Now, again, we don't use these, but um, another application of that bimetallic strip, also using a mercury switch. I just wanna point out one last thing. Uh, whenever you're working with fuses, however they might be, you might find an old inline type of fuse like this, or the ones that are located in your car. Whatever you do, don't go cheap. There are manufacturers out there that are making these and they're not really up to uh, standard. I ended up finding at that the hard way, I ended up buying a no-name brand uh, fuse. And when I put that fuse in, it didn't end up blowing, it ended up melting the entire thing. So do yourself a favor, if you're gonna buy fuses, make sure they're UL rated or something like that. Make sure that they are a, uh, a reputable company. Um, but one other thing, if you have a 15 amp fuse, whatever you do, do not replace it with a larger fuse. Again, you end up making the weak link, the wires in your vehicle. So, all right, uh, that's a lot, but that's our quiz for today. Thank you for watching another Idealized Science Institute video. We are a nonprofit organization. If you like what you've seen, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want, leave a comment below. It's helpful to us. If you can financially support us, go to our website and hit the donate button. If you can't, simply by sharing these videos with other teachers and students in your life will be helpful. While at our website, you'll find that we have our Idealized Science Institute book, That'll help you engage your students in dialogic discourse. There you'll also find we have a podcast where we break down educational research. We also have long form lessons. If you're a teacher, you can watch these and go in the very next day and enact these. Along with this, we also have many other resources, including more quick quizzes. So thank you for watching and we hope to see you in the next one.